Okay, so now we're moving on to the next section, which is on um, management. And our first speaker is Rick Mathot, and he's going to talk about uh, stock synthesis and uh, management and MSE and a whole lot of related concepts. Okay, so hopefully all this is going to work for me. So thanks, Mark, for the opportunity to come and, and speak on this. I'm going to have a range of topics in this presentation, and uh, hopefully we'll all know a little bit more about uh, what we've been doing with stock synthesis at the end of this. this is gonna have... Mr. Mouse work? Yeah, that was. Yeah, sorry. Don't know why. Yeah, I'm just messed up and down. Um. Can you try? Yes, that's it. Okay. Good. That'll be easier. Okay. Thanks again. No, it's not going to work either, is it? We really made this hard on ourselves. There we go. We'll try that. I think that'll work. Okay, so I'd like to go a little bit over the history of stock synthesis. We certainly have talked a little bit about it here, but it really is a very long history. I'd like an opportunity to just lay it out for you a bit. A uh, little bit of an overview of the components of SS. Uh, a brief example with a focus on this thing that we do on the recruitment bias adjustment in, in here. Then from there, I'm gonna move on to you know, more of the theme of this, uh, this talk, which is uh, how do we go about looking at reference points inside of the model and then progress from there into forecasting in order to project uh, the management quantity. So I'll provide an example of that. And then I'll lead into some subsequent talks on uh, further discussion on forecasting, as well as on development of a management strategy evaluation framework. So, I guess. So this, this issue of stock synthesis came up very early in my career. Uh, in, 19, in the early 1980s, we had a challenge with the anchovy assessment in Southern California. And there we were looking to combine a variety of types of data in order to make this happen. And the concept of synthesis really is about the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. We had some really disparate data types, no one of which was sufficient to support an assessment, but we knew that collectively they did provide very relevant information. So synthesis grew out of the, the need to pull together these diverse data sources. It was a low fishing mortality situation. So we really couldn't do VPA. We didn't have annual surveys. So production model stuff didn't quite work either for short-lived species. And so we built this, this stock synthesis concept. It includes things that we hear today. And as I talk through this, I, I'm really gonna to try to draw some parallels between the things that were there in, you know, 35 years ago. Uh, we had these concepts there and they're really on the table today and some of the themes that we've been addressing. So we have fleets as areas as one of the themes that's in there. We had temperature effects and a variety of other things. It was not that large of a model at that time. It's remarkable on how concisely I could write it all down at that time. It, you know, this no longer exists with the richness of the, the features that we built in today. But at one point, it was just one page of equations that could largely lay out what was in the model. One of the concepts that we needed to have in there just because of the nature of the data we had on the fisheries was the need for dome-shaped selectivity. And we had in there the, the idea of a temperature effect uh, on the selectivity parameters. 
we were sharing parameters. We had a U.S. fishery and a Mexican fishery, and we had a separate only on by one parameter on the form of the furs we're using. So some of the concepts that we are building in today, uh, you know, were pioneered uh, there for us. The idea that we needed to account for aging imprecision. Uh, and, and these 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 text clips you hear, they were things that are just taken out of a, a 1986 technical memo that was uh, there at the Southwest Fishery Science Center. So you know these concepts, we we wrote them down. We were thinking about them uh, at that time. So the idea of aging uh, error was part of this this first model. The the concept of data weighting also was there. The re realization that different likelihood components for different parts of the data. We knew we didn't have the variance exactly right for all of them, so they couldn't just go into the model uh, with no capability for adjustment for those weightings. So this concept of, of data weighting was there. And I, I didn't clip it out anything further, but there was a whole paragraph in there about the shortcomings of multinomial as the likelihood basis. And we've still been talking about the shortcomings of multinomial and uh, didn't solve it then. And, I don't think we've solved it now either. Estimation, now this is really you know, sort of interesting here, is it's a very custom approach uh, that I built in order to do this, something I tinkered with for years and years. And uh, this is all going on in parallel with Dave Fournier's work um, with, with ADMB. Uh, he was working on, on the uh, automatic calculations of, of the derivatives and everything I have here is all based upon finite differences. And, they would say, no, how can you possibly make it work with finite differences? I said, well, you know, it's close enough, it's a little slower, but you know, it can work. One of the interesting things is that at each iteration, I was calculating and inverting the full Hessian. So I actually had information on the covariance as it was making the iterative steps to the next uh, parameter values. And I had a sparse matrix approach in it and that I realized that you didn't need to re recalculate all those things that were essentially zero. So the probability that a number got recalculated was based upon the last value of that number, plus some random elements so that occasionally you'd search space. So it's totally ad hoc. I had no training in numerical optimization, but it, it worked. It, it did what we needed. And you know, the, the idea you know, I've kept through many times is that model complexity has increased but the tolerable runtime, and Ernesto, you've expressed this several times that if you can get it done overnight, that's good enough, right? And so it was pretty much an overnight run uh, at that time, and uh, it stayed that way for a long time. So again, you know, one of the little results that came from it, again, we, you know, data weighting, you know, this, these three different versions of a result were, were different uh, based upon how one of the data elements was weighted. So you're, we're really uh, concerned about that and taking that into account uh, as we were using the model. So you know, that was the earliest history. Uh, poor Larry Jacobson inherited this model from me when I left and moved to Seattle and he took over the anchovy assessment. Uh, the code was you know, written in, in some old Fortran that I guess was 77 at that time. As it should be. It was. And, um, and so he ended up in hiring that code. So I moved to Seattle and now it was no longer working on short-lived coastal pelagic species. And now the uh, emphasis has shifted to the, the groundfish, uh, longer lived species off the US West Coast. So I took what I had learned from the development of the SS for anchovy and, and built two models. One tailored for a species for which we had um, really poor aging data uh, we, we had just detected a bias in some of the older ages. There was a lot of length data. Uh, it was a really long-lived species. So we, we knew that if we're going to use the length data, and we didn't really know growth really well because of all the problems with the aging, we had to build growth estimation uh, into this approach. That was the SINEL version uh, at that time. It was built for sablefish, uh, a very valuable species along the U.S. West Coast. The other model was SINE. Uh, uh, which was designed for Pacific hake, which is a rather migratory species along the U.S. West Coast. And it migrates north and on the feeding grounds in the summertime is when it's fished, partly in Canada, partly in the U.S. And, and the uh, env environmental effects on the movement into Canada was really apparent. In some years, 
warm years, a lot of fish in Canada, other years not. So the combination of these things led to the characteristics of this SINE model. So it had multiple areas, uh, had aging imprecision, all those features. So both of these models were developed there in 1988-89 and uh, were the ones that were used for West Coast ground fish assessments through the 1990s. Um, and, and, and this right is, to, is the start of the uh, expansion of the use of SS. There wasn't much exploration, a little bit of interest outside of our, our laboratory, but uh, the, the start was along the U.S. West Coast uh, with this work that was being done in Seattle. During the 90s, it expanded to be used for, you know, essentially all of the U.S. Uh, uh, West Coast, uh, Pacific Coast uh, ground fish, you know, little rock fishes, flatfish, we had about a dozen different species that were being done with it by um, the late 1990s. This is the time, as, as Eric said in his talk, that uh, custom ADMB models uh, started to show up. The other thing, thing that happened was I became a supervisor, and that meant my work on supporting and developing and advancing the model uh, really slowed way, way, way down for, for several years uh, there in the, in the late 1990s. But nevertheless, the, uh, the use of the model was, was continuing to grow at that time. Then we come to 2003, and I was no longer a supervisor. And I would now was able to uh, have a side project and get back into re-looking at this model. And by this time, ADMB had matured enough, and everybody was proud of me. Rick, you really need to write it into uh, ADMB. And so I had an opportunity uh, in 2003. I actually was in the in Washington, D.C. at the time, and a hurricane was arriving. And I managed to maintain power in my hotel room long enough to write the code, uh, the, the beginnings of the code for SS in ADMB. So that conversion happened there in 2003 uh, while I had an opportunity to hold up in a hotel over a weekend with a hurricane uh, on the outside. When, the, when I wrote this model, I merged many of the features. I took nearly everything that was there in Cine and Cinelf in the old Fortran models, took nearly everything in there and, uh, and combined it into one. I've regretted that some since then because uh, it, it means that we don't have a very efficient version of SS that's only age-based. Uh, everything has characteristics of, of the length still in there. Nevertheless, it was now a generalized model that could cover a wide variety of situations. You don't mention how much faster the current model was in terms of since that was, well, there was an ego issue here. Yeah, there was, um, I mean, it was really apparent. Once, once uh, growth parameters became an estimable quantity, there was like a five-fold uh, increase in runtime uh, just with that change to a, something that had gradients associated with it. So I wish you could separate it out today. Next model needs to do so. Modular, more modular. So I mean, a lot of other things are happening at this time. Um, Ian Stewart and then subsequently Ian Taylor uh, worked with uh, the r for ss to process the output. Um, now there starts to be you know, more of an expansion. Uh, Andre taking the model to Cyro, uh, Mark in, in um, Southern California to the Tuna Commission and uh, Clay Porch encouraged uh, work in the southeast, uh, south, uh, southeast center of the U.S. And it also started to become used uh, commonly in, um, among the students at University of Washington, which was another opportunity for, you know, spreading the, uh, the information about, you know, what are the capabilities of this model and how might it be used. All these things contributed. And so, you know, it led to this diaspora. And, and, you know, a number of people who you know, were the evangelicals uh, who, who spread the word and, and carried it around. And I don't know, I got, probably got lots wrong. I probably offended lots of people with this appear at all the people I've left off. But it, it, there were a lot of people. I don't who, think Gavin lives in Hudson Bay, just saying. Well, you know, sometimes. <laughs> I mean, it's cold in Woods Hole. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I had to, they're close enough. The idea is that, yeah. The, the diversity is huge. I mean, we, we've had a number of people, uh, you know, several people in this room uh, have done courses uh, around the world. Um, a couple have gone to um, uh, South America. We've had courses in Chile that have been very successful. 
uh, in uh, you know, introducing uh, the opportunity to use this there. Um, and you know, so it's been, been very gratifying uh, the degree to which it's found a way to be used uh, in so many uh, different situations. So today, you know, certainly we have you know, continued use. I, I don't have a way of knowing how many people use it. I get surprised all the time when someone says, hey, you know, I, I've tried it for this. Um, you know, I'm sure it's well over 100 stocks have been looked at, many in a research mode, not necessarily in a, in a uh, application for the, the final stock assessment, but at least in a research mode. Um, we, we now have a team, uh, a small team, uh, working with me on this, uh, one and a half contractors, uh, con high contribution for several Northwest Center staff who are, most of them are, are sitting in the back row here and uh, you'll be hearing from them in later talks. Um, uh, we have a couple of grants that are letting us do a couple of uh, augmentation projects, one on tagging, one on MSCs, uh, some of which we'll hear about. We collectively do two or three workshops a year or do a webinars. Um, we, we have this, this NOAA VLAB as our repository for code development and another one for the community engagement. Uh, and, and we've been able to develop a number of tools, a graphical interface, as well as a number of, of the R tools that help. And we generally are able to put out two or three uh, releases a year, as well as making available uh, you know, new, new little bug fixes that we find. So we've, we've maintained a way to uh, push this out well, actually, we can't push it out to the community. We make it available to the community, uh, but we still are in a pull mode. Uh, people uh, need to become aware and then pull uh, new versions as they become available. So I'm going to transition now. So that's, our, that's the history. That's how we got uh, to where we're at today. And, um, you know, it's no longer, you know, just me, me doing this. I mean, I really rely upon the team for, you know, so much of the support uh, to get this done. You know, just a screenshot here from our, our VLAB page uh, where things are, are accessible. So transitioning now to, um, you know, what does SS look like? What are these components that we have built in? So certainly, you know, like essentially all the integrated analysis models, there's good separation between the population model and the observation model. You can run the population model with no data and you could just set it up and it can run and uh, you know, produce estimates of the population that you've encoded. Uh, the observation model is where there's a rich development of a great diversity of data types that then can be compared to uh, expected values derived from that model. So the, the, the strength, it, I think, is largely in the diversity of things for which it can create an expected value. Close kin mark recapture will be a challenge, but it's certainly conceivable uh, that things like that can also uh, fit into that category. Um, uses ADMB, um, converting the TMB would be really, really challenging, but you know, it's, I guess it's, every, anything is conceivable. Um, and, but another part of the power is that it fully integrates uh, equilibrium calculations that let us do all aspects of reference points. And it then progresses from there, and I'll definitely get into this in a bit more. It progresses from calculating a reference point and then using that reference point to project uh, what potential catches should be in order to implement a harvest policy. And it does this in a way to preserve the gradient structure so that the variance in the estimated parameters gets propagated onto the derived quantities. So that when we want to calculate what is the probability that fishing according to this harvest control rule will leave the stock above BMSY 10 years from now, we can calculate that probability and, and that takes into account the uncertainty and all of the parameters and all the covariances of those parameters um, is all taken into account as we get that, that probability 10 years into the future. The population model itself, talk a little bit about that. Um, it, you know, we've used the term in this uh, meeting so far, you hear the term partition. Well, this partition concept is certainly uh, there and, and, and fully developed in SS in much, much the way that you see it in the other models. 
you know, there's a, there's a partition for uh, different what we call biotypes for growth. Uh, see, male and female are partitions. Settlement time is uh, timing. Timing within a year is one of the concepts that is pretty richly developed in SS. And one aspect of that is that recruitment for some species is not a knife edge event. You know, all the animals show up on April 1st. That's not the way it happens. And for some species, it's quite protracted. So the idea that we could take the total recruits and apportion it again amongst a collection of a settlement events so that there's some spread in the actual date of recruitment uh, among, species, among uh, animals is something that very much interacts with growth and the subsequent data we have uh, on size and age uh, for those animals. So settlement time is a concept that's in there. Uh, we heard from Rich McGarvey's talk yesterday, uh, the, the concepts of the, um, the growth platoons so that we can take into account size survivorship. So there's an easy mechanism to flip the switch and, and turn on uh, that mechanism. Uh, recruitment is fundamentally uh, coded as a, um, a deviation from a spawner recruit curve. So why, why did I adopt that and not just estimate recruits as individual recruits and then um, and subsequently uh, estimate a spawner recruit curve from those estimated recruits? The, the reason really is rooted in the nature of the West Coast groundfish where we had really long lived species. We had very little age data going back in time. We had a long history of low exploitation. And, and we, we adopted an approach that we would model a long time series and let the data slowly come in. And I'll very much show this in an example coming up. But, but that really conditioned this, this concept of, we'll fundamentally say that recruits come from a spawner recruit curve and will allow deviations from that curve and taking that approach for modeling of recruitment. Um, and you know, there's a lot of aspects of the, we now can do regime shifts and a variety of other environmental effects on recruitment. We have an area concept um, and much like what we've seen in the other models already, not, don't need to say anything more about that. But we, well, when animals move between areas, they do retain their natal biology. So we have a, a partition, uh, a partition is now apportioned among areas and it stays as a member of that partition as a biological partition as it moves to another area. Uh, a rich set of uh, options on how to model the selectivity and catchability uh, of the fishing fleets and surveys. Um, and generally we're estimating Fs to match the catch. But one of the new concepts that we have uh, looked at recently and built in now is the idea that uh, you know, catch is not necessarily calibrated as well as we once thought it was. So essentially catch has a cue too, and that cue may have some uncertainty to it. And our, the parameters of the model, all of which are, are, have a, a wide range of capabilities for let, allowing them to be time varying or for potentially density dependent uh, over time. So the observation model, um, again, catches with Q. I mean, there, there can be a Q on catch. We've learned this strongly as we've had to recalibrate the recreational catches in the Southeast region of the US. And we find that for some aspects of it, what we thought was recreational catch is now, the numbers are now three times higher for some fishing fleets. And so that recalibration means that, well, the calibration itself is something that is inherently uncertain inherently is something. So this is a feature that now can be used for IUU, it can be used for historical reconstructions that we have uncertainty about, this, this concept that there's a cue on, on catch too, it's not just we know catch. Uh, discards, a rich set of options for having retention functions and dealing with discard as a component of the overall catch of a fleet. We deal with absolute abundance as well as uh, something we'll call a uh, you know, a guesstimate on depletion, the, the DBSRA approach is something that you can just do. I mean, it's I mean, what Chantal showed the other day about sort of data limited approaches that's been used richly uh, in those data limited approaches. And, and you could build it in, we essentially could build it in as a prior now, you know, we could, we could run a data, you know, uh, a very data rich model, but we could have in it uh, this concept of a, 
of a, of a guesstimate on the degree of depletion is sort of a, a, a background of that's um, helping to move the model in the right direction uh, until the data become uh, very informative. Uh, large number of opportunities for different indices of abundance, indices of effort, uh, an index of a random effect. You know, we can say we have our environmental variable that we relate to uh, fluctuations in selectivity or, or something else over time. Um, there's um, the ability to use weight composition data. You know, oftentimes uh, fishing fleets in their sales of fish to processors will have it broken down into weight categories. Well, that's just a very crude size composition. And uh, you know, so we have a way of, of creating an expected value for a weight composition. Uh, there's one application for shrimp in the Gulf of Mexico where, where the model runs monthly and it has monthly weight composition that comes in the counts of shrimp per, you know, how many tails per pound per shrimp are, are they selling? And that data is very, very informative about the cohort progression and about the, um, the, the, the overall mortality. So again, you know, the, the riches of, of features of the number of different things that we can create an expected value for, you know, all of which comes from you know, the, the model has a the population age length structure. It uses growth, uses numbers at age. It has the age length at some point in time. And then we can apply age and size selectivity. We, they can operate simultaneously. We can have gear effects causing size selectivity and maybe, you know, uh, diffusion into deep water causing age selectivity for a given fleet. Uh, we can have sex selectivity. So we, we have the age length population, we sample from that, and then we can apply aging imprecision to that in order to get uh, ages in terms of what we think we actually are, are observing. Everything's moving in the direction of trying to replicate in the model the processes that we think created the data so that we can compare apples to apples when we compare the data to the expected values from the model. So moving closer to what Mark originally asked me to talk about, which was management quantities. Um, so let's think about the, this pathway of going from this model that we've now estimated. So that's in the upper left-hand corner. We have um, MLE or we have from uh, MCE Val, um, uh, an estimate of the population and we have this estimate with, with variance. So flowing, let's see, going to the right across the top, um, you know, part of what we've estimated as part of this population modeling is the spawner recruit curve, we have selectivity for all the fleets, the natural mortality rate, we have growth, we have movement, we have all of these vital rate characteristics are, have now been estimated as part of the population modeling. We could feed these into basically yield per recruit, spawning biomass per recruit, dynamic pool calculations that are all done now on a per recruit basis. And from those, we can now calculate you know, the various reference points, so FSPR, B target, MSY, and the like. Then going back, coming down over here, we also get uh, coming out of the population model, uh, just running forward uh, one year to the beginning of the first year of the forecast, we have the numbers at age. We also have the body size uh, at age of all, all of our, of all of the partitions at that point in time. So now we're gonna take, you know, the, the ending state of the model and the reference points. And now we can bring those together uh, into the forecast and then the forecast going forward into, you know, what, what quantities do we wanna now provide uh, to the managers? So, did I skip a slide. Nope, we're okay. So from there, I mean, let's let's now take this, and we're going to generate an SS example just to, to show some of these principles. So taking uh, SS as an operating model, so I'm just going to give it a bunch of parameters. I'm going to give it a random time series of recruitment deviations, and we're going to simulate a population. Um, and I'm going to generate, you know, I'm going to go back a long ways in time, 1931, to generate my population. And now I'm going to start generate because we have a parametric 
bootstrap uh, data generator built within. So we can now generate data from this model. Um, and I'm going to start the data in 1971. And then I'm going to turn it around and we're going to use SS as an estimation model. I'm going to make it easy on myself. I'm going to tell that I know some of these things. But there's actually a lot that's, that's getting estimated. We're estimating spawn root fruit, estimating growth curves. Didn't estimate M though. Probably should have. Um, and so we now do the estimation model. And now let's see what SS is doing with the recruitments. So here in blue, uh, the line that fluctuates from the beginning year is, is the true time sequence of recruitment deviations. These are as deviants. Um, and you can see they're fluctuating it's with sigma R, sigma R 0.6, starting from year one, 1931. The estimated deviates um, do what you would expect given the data we've given it. In the later years, they do pretty well at estimating uh, the real deviates. But as you go back in time, they get blurrier and blurrier until there's no signal in the data. And so the deviates just collapse to be an estimate of zero because there's nothing in the data to tell it that it's anything different than zero. So that all works. It does what we would expect it to do. But there are consequences because these are, you know, deviates in, in log space. So what's the estimated variance of each of those recruitment deviates look like? So here at the top in blue are the ones in the early years, 1931 to 58, and sigma R is 0.6. So guess what? The estimated variance of nearly all of them is 0.6. But then there are a few that got a little different than that as we got closer uh, in time to a more modern era. And then there's sort of a transition period where the data start to be felt a little bit. And so here uh, we have a little bit, they're, they're a little bit more informed. So the, the variance on them is less than 0.6 because there's now some information in the data that's uh, absorbing some of the overall variance. And then in the data rich era, uh, we see that the, the estimated uh, standard error of each recruitment deviation is now much less. So they're, they're now much informed uh, by the data. And we also see a, an interesting pattern, it's a pattern that uh, Ian and I noted in our 19, 2011 paper. We, we haven't really found a way to deal with this, but um, large recruitment deviations are estimated more precisely than, than weak ones. And that makes sense because the, the signal for a big recruitment is way more obvious than the data. Everybody can see it. Whereas weak year classes, especially if you have a lot of size data, especially if you have aging error, weak year classes just sort of get lost in the noise. So their estimated variance is going to be greater. So these are the kind of things that we, we, we see going on. And, and this difference in the estimated standard error of the recruitments uh, means that we have a, a, a tool that we can use uh, to adjust the expected value to maintain the right mean recruitment expectation. So here is, you know, how we apply it to, to do this thing. We, we characterize it as the recruitment bias adjustment. So that uh, in the data rich era, the green line is the bias adjusted line. So it's adjusted downward so that the arithmetic recruitments that are um, now going to be calculated from it will have the correct mean. Whereas early in time when there's no information, uh, there's no bias adjustment because the DEVs are all zero, so in order to get the right mean recruitment, we don't adjust them downwards. This is all built in uh, to the SS process in order to uh, be able to transition smoothly from data weak eras in the, in the early parts of the time series to data rich eras and keep the whole thing internally consistent. So now let's shift gears again and now let's go to the equilibrium calculations and how that leads us to uh, reference point capabilities. <coughs> so the, the equilibrium calculator operates on a um, per recruit and, the, and it operates in a way that maintains complete compatibility with all aspects of the time series calculations, but now is not doing it as a time series of on cohorts, it's basically taking one cohort and tracking it in equilibrium over its lifespan. 
And this cohort is, of course, needs to be broken up amongst all the partitions. So there's area and sex and bio patterns and platoons and settlement times. All these things exist in the equilibrium calculation as well. And so that means that as we progress from age to age, we also need to be applying migration. We need to apply the possibility of hermaphrodites changing sex and all the other processes that we possibly could build in are now operating on a on the platoon, the one platoon that we're moving through the equilibrium calculation. So everything is applied identically, run it out to three times maximum age, because we can't do a plus group calculation because of the possibility of movement. Can't quite do the movement calculation there in a plus group. So instead we run it out to three times max age and collapse the result uh, back down. Now there is one limitation that's caused by, by doing things this way. And it's something that stands in the way of having area-specific spotter recruit relationships in SS. Um, we could easily do that uh, for the time series, but the equilibrium calculation cannot be done that way. And, and the, the problem is that if there's movement between areas and there's different fishing rates in different areas, then the amount of spawning biomass in area B is going to depend upon movement from area A where there's different uh, fishing rates going on there. And so you create a, um, a logical inconsistency. You cannot do it in one pass through. So it's possible that we can uh, drive a sufficient approximation by going through the equilibrium calculation a fixed number of times, say three or four times, so that we now can let the proportion of recruits that show up in this area be dependent upon the proportion of spawning biomass that is in that area, which also depends upon the amount of fishing uh, in all the areas. So that's a, in a level of complexity we've not yet implemented, but it's conceivable that we could approach it there because I know there's interest in having uh, area-specific uh, spawn of recruit. But this, this is really the only impediment uh, to doing so. So if somebody solved that problem, please let us know. So you know, again, we're doing a yield per recruit, spotting biomass per recruit calculations as standard. Um, and we can use those to then calculate the kind of reference points uh, we want. And there's a, a number of user controls uh, in there on, on which things we're actually going to look for. Uh, they, they do need to search uh, for these quantities. Uh, the search operates um, in a way to maintain uh, the gradient structure operates over a fixed number of iterations that helps um, and, and the results then can be used for doing you know like producing a Kobe plot uh, using doing a dynamic V0. Uh, we've also built in a, uh, a global MSY search to basically step through all the ages and just calculate um, uh, MSY uh, using a knife edge selection uh, which is an interesting exercise because oftentimes is way bigger MSY you get from a knife edge selection than the variety of selectivity curves uh, that are already uh, in, in reality the case. So it's a, it's a good thing to present uh, the managers on you know, how much the potential uh, could be increased or how much potential is not being realized because of the way in which the, the fishery is prosecuted. So we have reference points uh, and we have variants uh, on these reference points. And you know, so here's just a table you know, showing some of these results. Uh, the first set of columns uh, shows uh, what we got from searching for the, the F that would give a biomass that's 31% of unfished biomass um, while taking into account the spawner recruit rate. Uh, the middle uh, set of columns is the uh, SPR, spawning biomass per recruit, uh, 42%. And then the, the uh, right-hand columns are the F to give MSY. Uh, originally, I chose uh, three F levels that actually in my operating model that I created the data from, uh, what I chose as 31% and 42% both matched the MSY. But now when I estimate the model off the generated data, uh, these shift a little bit, but they're still pretty close. Uh, what's the F is 0.245 uh, to give the first column, 0.248 in the middle, and then 0.235, so not too different. And certainly you notice that what I put in yellow 
uh, hope, bold is that the, the F for FSPR, which is a per recruit calculation, it can be calculated way more precisely than the one, than the B31% and the MSY, which depend upon spawner recruit, on the spawner recruit curve. So just the existence of that, you know, certainly influences the degree of uncertainty uh, in our estimates that we get. They all are influenced by selectivity. Yeah. Okay, so we now have Fs that we potentially could use as the basis for, for harvest policy. Uh, so in SS, we have three stages of, of forecast. I think the third stage here that I'll talk about is, is pretty unique. And um, you know, I, I think it, it helps us get a better understanding. So I will go towards uh, presenting an example of how this plays out. So the first stage, we're just gonna calculate the, uh, what we call the annual catch limit. Or, or I shouldn't say it. No, it's not the annual catch limit. It's the OFL. It's the overfishing limit. It's the overfishing limit in the US lingo for our guidance for, for fishery policy. So it's, you'll, I'll, do it, I'll do it in more detail. I, I can do simultaneous translations. So. Yeah, 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 there you go. So we're gonna do, so. <laughs> In brief, we'll do first, we'll go through once and calculate the, the limits. And then we're gonna go through again and calculate the targets. And then we're gonna go through again and we're gonna use the target as if we set the target based upon last year's assessment. And now we're using it this year and we're to calculate what's the effect on the population of catching the target that was based upon the assessment that had been done. So we're gonna feed it back. We're gonna have a mini MSE here, which is you know, a little bit of feedback. So stage one, again, we're gonna find the annual catch limit. I mean, how did I get that language wrong? I invented it almost. <laughs> Pamela invented it. I carried it on. So um, we're to apply the F limit uh, in doing this and uh, user has a variety of choices on what to do. We're not going to apply recruitment deviations to it because guess what? You don't know what the recruitment deviations are going to be in the future. So you're going to act as if recruitment's going to be at equilibrium levels, coming off the spawn recruit curve, or there are other options. Um, the cohort uh, length and age is going to continue to propagate into the future according to the annual growth parameters, so that if you have time varying growth, it's going to continue to propagate forward uh, along the cohort growth trajectories as we do this stage one of the forecast. This is just to get these overfishing limits by applying the full uh, F limit. The second rule, we're now gonna use our harvest control rule. And we have harvest control rules that look like this, where the, the red line, the horizontal line is the F that is the F limit. And then the green is the F that is the F target. So the concept of a buffer is there at high biomass levels, as well as a ramp down in the F um, down to a cutoff level. Uh, we recently implemented um, the concept of the buffer being time period because why do you want that? Well, as you go further into the future, you really don't have as much confidence on exactly uh, what the limit should be. And so you should build in more of a buffer the further into the future you rely upon uh, the current assessment. The bump dragon, yeah, you're, you'll get there. You'll <laughs> get there. And so again, <laughs> yeah. so there's a few options for, for how to manipulate this. A lot of it in response to, to regions um, who have different uh, policies and need different permutations on, on this basic theme. But the basic theme is implemented in many parts of the world and I'm sure we could find uh, an option that, that suits you or could be modified easily to do so. So we have the harvest control rule that's gonna be the starting point for how to calculate the target catch. So here in stage two, uh, we're gonna find our annual catch target, starting with the harvest control rule, and then we're gonna be able to apply modifiers because it, you know, things are never as simple as we want them to be. It's easy as stock assessments modelers to just be you know, projecting forward according to an F, but the managers always want something different. They want, oh, these, these 
three fleets are the recreational fleets and they get 50% of the quota. And you know, these other fleets are all the uh, commercial fleets and they get the other 50%. Well, those kind of options are built in. So we can apply constraints. We can say that, well, there's a limit on the total, what's the largest catch that we can allow. We can put a limit on that. So all these various constraints um, are, as well as fixed input catches, um, can all be applied here at the beginning of stage two. And from that, we calculate a, um, a, what would essentially be a fleet specific quota for that year, apply that quota and progress into the next year. We're still not gonna be applying recruitment deviation because we're now still at the stage of setting the quota for next year. We aren't knowing what its effect is yet. So we're just saying we're going to project um, and we're going to apply these constraints and calculate what the quota uh, should be. And we're going to store these. And now we're going to go back through the forecast loop one last time. So now the, the, the concept that we're after at this point is to calculate the effect on the stock of catching that catch target. We're going to use those stored quotas. And, but now we're going to turn on stochastic recruitment and we're going to turn on implementation error, if you want to. Uh, we're going to turn on environmental effects and other time variant things. We, you know, as we progressively work more on the forecast option, we see the opportunity to have more uncertainty propagate uh, into this forecast. And now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the future F that you would need in order to calculate, in order to catch that stored catch quota while taking into account these uncertainties that have now been turned on. We can express the results in terms of things like F over FMSY or B over BMSY, and we will end up with the variance on those quantities. Are you sure about number three? You didn't turn that on earlier? No, I, actually that's why the triple star is there. Yeah. I, when I wrote that down, I went, huh, is it really, I really want it to be Control. I think we want to need a control on that on when we turn that on. Yeah, I think it happens earlier. I think it does too, but I, I think I wrote it down here and I put stars on it. Perfect. So let's just, so um, yeah, so this is a brief demo of that. Um, I'll probably spend 10 minutes on the demo slide. Uh, I'm going to run, show three of them. Uh, one is what things look like in terms of variance of these quantities in the future. Um, if there's no deviations, if we turn on the recruitment deviations, we do recruitment deviations and implementation error, and also what would happen if we actually turned on those variance things in stage one, rather than wait until stage three to turn them off. So it's all here, and um, let me get, turn around so I can get... What? So just looking at this a little bit, uh, in the upper right here, we're looking at the standard error of the ratio of F to FFSY. And so if there's no recruitment deviations, there's no variance in this, we just set it where we wanted it. Um, if we have just recruitment deviations turned on, but no implementation error, well, in the early years, F is right where we thought it would be because nothing much has disturbed it yet, but over time it gets more and more uncertain. If we um, turn on recruitment DUs and implementation error. Well, now the implementation error creates a pretty high uh, uncertainty in the F because there's implementation error. And as you go forward from here, if we actually had turned on the recruitment deviations in stage one, well, that means that we now are setting the quotas as if we knew what the recruitment was going to be in the future. So um, now it's really only the implementation error that causes uncertainty in the Fs. But if both are happening, both recruitment Ds and implementation error, then it ramps up according to the green line. So that's what happens at F. And there's you know, a story to be told about each of the other uh, quantities. Looking down here in the lower right, the quantity here is the standard error in the estimate of a future survey. So we can tell SS to give us the expected value 
for a survey that we expect to be conducted in the future. We give a prediction of what we're going to measure when we go out into the field. And as you would expect, you know, the, the variance of this expected future survey, uh, you know, propagates into the future according to, you know, about what we would expect to see happen. So, you know, we, we, can, we can demonstrate here, um, you know, the effect of doing things, trying to take into account more realistically all aspects of what things cause uncertainty in the future. You know, one of the, the developments uh, in the U.S. in order to implement our, our um, precautionary harvest policy uh, has been to implement this buffer-based approach and to base it upon, you know, the probability that overfishing uh, would be occurring. And so, you know, some, some, there have been developed, some folks in, uh, in Eric's shop uh, develop methods to, you know, look at this thing we called P-star. So calculate the F that would give you a given uncertainty of overfishing. We can't quite turn it around and do it that way inside of SS, but we could do it the other way around. We could calculate the probability of overfishing given a buffer size and then just adjust the buffer sizes until we get the probability of overfishing uh, that we are, are targeting. So, you know, the next step beyond this, you know, is, is really, you know, using it inside of an MSC. You know, this, this forecast approach, this three-stage forecast approach is already a mini MSC, but it really isn't realistic to do it 10 years in the future because you never set quotas 10 years in the future. You know, two, three, four years, yeah, that happens a lot. Uh, but after that, you really need to redo the assessment, update things, and then progress forward. Well, that's an MSC with feedback. So the next stage is really to develop tools uh, to do that. And we'll be hearing about that um, in, uh, in upcoming talks. In fact, immediately after this, we'll hear, hear from Skylar in that regard. And, and there have been some, some prototypes, there are some projects that have done MSCs like this uh, uh, using SS to investigate harvest policies. And uh, it is something that can be done generally by building an R wrapper uh, around SS. We'll hear more about that in some upcoming talks. So, I mean, let me summarize now. Uh, SS gives us a, a really flexible set of population processes uh, to build into our, our approaches. It allows for a, a very a diverse set of data to be used. Um, and, you know, we saw from the side-by-side -side that Mark put up yesterday that, you know, it's right up there with, with the others on, on the types of data uh, that can go into this. Um, from Chantal's talk, we saw how seamlessly you can transition from data limited to complex models and, and do this really seamlessly. Uh, it's now, you know, very widely used, um, overwhelmingly widely used in terms of my email inbox. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's really, you know, you know quite, quite gratifying that it has been successful uh, in, um, in supporting uh, the, the needs of the community. Um, because of you know its its you know widespread use, the the collective development of you know, some additional tools, you know, work that you know Chantal, uh, Ian, Kelly in the back, and others uh, to develop R for SS and other tools that really just magnifies uh, the, the 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 use of it. It really uh, exemplifies you know the value of having generalized models that can then support uh, these kind of, of tool development. And it continues to evolve, and uh, you know, it will continue to, uh, to evolve uh, to try to take advantage. We try to you know, reach out to the research community and bring things in, bringing in uh, Dirichlet multinomial, uh, bringing in autocorrelated uh, recruitments, you know, conducting studies, doing uh, side projects, development in a research mode, and then move it into the operational model. There's some shortcomings. I mean, it's a, it's a large and complex code base. Um, I'm the only one who really can pull together all the pieces of it. There's others who could do, you know, get in there. But uh, if it's a, a big thing that has a lot of moving parts, um, you know, it, it would be daunting for someone up to get up to speed uh, at this point in time. Um, you know, like I said, when I converted, uh, when I created um, the ADMB version from CINE and CINEL back in 2003. I regret at that time that I didn't keep a cleaner separation between the growth side of the house and the, the numbers side of the house uh, because it makes it, it, creates too much overhead if you want to run it in a numbers only mode with just inputs of body weights. 
Um, the input approach is pretty inelegant, not that there aren't other models out there that are equally inelegant, but uh, you know, I think you know, things that, that Matthew is developing, Matthew and Christine for MAS, uh, the castle approach, I, I see you know, good merit in, in using that kind of a, a keyword approach of telling the model what you want to do rather than being forced to tell you the model everything that it wants to know in this exact order. Uh, I think that could be done better. There's no random effects. But you can do penalized Ds, and in my mind, you get most of it, most of it, by doing that. Show me otherwise. It's not multi-species, but a number of people have been able to bring in predators as another fishing fleet. And it would be easy to create another class. <coughs> Fleets have classes inside of SS. You, to explicitly create a predator class and give it some particular features would be very straightforward. Um, it's not highly spatial, but we can see plenty of applications that are two to six areas are, are certainly uh, infeasible. There are too many options uh, and there's not enough guidance. And you know, that's one of the things that I've learned that helping people use the model well is one of the big challenges. Uh, just giving everybody the full range of options is too much, too much flexibility for a wide range of the user base. And many people need to know how to use it, be told how to use it, um, and not. So, th and this is where um, the base model can have all the flexibility you want. If you create an interface between the user and the model, that's where you take into account the guidance on how to use the model. I, mean, I think that's way better than trying to do it at the model level itself. So interfaces should be integral. So looking ahead, you know, continue to support for the user community, minor augmentations, I have a hard time saying no. Um, more rigorous testing of model changes. We have some things going on with our team trying to you know, shore up our ability to, to test things before we push them out the door. Sort of use the Google approach, you know, put the beta out there, see how it works and then fix it. Um, and you know, certainly we continue to try to support research and good practices and consultation on this next generation model development. Thank you. Okay, thanks Rick. We've got some time for questions. Any questions other than Andre? Okay, okay Andre. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had a technical question because I've always wanted to know the answer and a more theoretical question. So my, my technical question is, when you've got time varying growth, isn't it true that your average, for your reference points, you can actually end up averaging the time varying uh, growth, you actually aren't starting with an equilibrium size structure. Because, oh sorry, equilibrium weighted age, uh, length of age, because you get what you get from the, the years over which you define your reference points. Um, I, I think that's true, it, yeah. it, it, it catches people if they don't know yeah, what. Yeah, that, that, that is true, it does not, recalculate equilibrium and that is something that that could be done but it's not done yeah and you don't know that you're doing it as uh, we discovered ah, okay. um uh, the more theoretical one is has anyone compared the asymptotic variances that you get basically by by using the delta method going forward versus actually simulating what's going on so basically just doing a monte carlo to see you know do you get the same thing because the, particularly when you're removing a catch, it compounds in ways that I don't think the asymptotics would do quite as well. So I think you're, you, you're getting the variances to increase, obviously, with, mm -hmm. with time, which is the right direction. Mm -hmm. But I'm suspecting that the compounding is probably not that accurate from a, a variance, covariance point of view. And, and if, I was do, if, if you could do an MCMC, I think you'd find the variances were bigger, but I, I'm just speculating and wondering yeah. if someone has looked at that. When we have done MCMCs, uh, I don't think we see that. I think we see, I mean, uh, I would defer to uh, probably, Ke you know, Kelly, Chantal, and Ian to see if they've seen anything like that, but I, I don't think anything like that has come up. Um, I, I would be interested, though, in uh, putting into it, you know, already it's going through three loops. I mean, it's conceivable you could do a, you know, fourth through a hundredth loop, each loop actually drawing actual Ds and running an alternative forecast with an actual sequence of Ds uh, into the future. I mean, that would be conceivable to do something like that. 
Yeah, that, that's actually what I've done because the thing is the cost is still pretty low. Right. Because uh, you're doing it in the forecast phase, not yep. in the estimation phase. Yep. Um, except when I did it in the first iteration in the estimation phase. That was stupid. Yeah, we actually wrote a paper on that, comparing MCMC and the, and the approximation to forecasting, mm -hmm. um, looking at the bias correction and the variance. And I think, if I remember correctly, the variances were okay. It was just the bias that was the problem. Yeah, Jim? Yeah. Uh, interesting recap of the history. Um, I had a couple of questions. One, you know, the growth thing seems like that's, even when you have data, it's often the case, it seems, that it's difficult to get the right annual process errors that you would see in actual highly parameterized data. Take halibut commission, they don't use uh, growth changes over time. Um, so that, that's one question. The other one is just on the projection side of things. Is it true that if your animal spawns in August, that um, you're not getting the fishing mortality down to August, that it's always begin year? Sorry, that's a yeah. minor question, but it's one that I've been confused on for a while. That's a 3.24 relic, right? So no, it's, you can have spawning happen at any time of year. It calculates things at spawn date. Correctly, right? But on the growth stuff, on, on the growth stuff as well. I mean, uh, one of the other thing I didn't talk about it, but on on growth and timing things, um, observations go into SS. Not here's an observation in this season. Here's an observation that goes in with month 4.4 because we think it's 40% of the way through the month of April, right? And so an SS sees a length observation on from middle of April, it says, oh, I need to calculate the age length key. I need to interpolate growth to that date, calculate an age length key just to apply at that point. Now there's some constraints in there so that it doesn't end up constantly recalculating age length keys, but you know, it's designed to deal with that. Because I was seeing too many instances where people wanted to stick with an annual model but they had a spring survey and a fall survey and they were giving the model length data and it was being compared to a July age length key. And so that's, that's, that's one of the great liabilities of length data is that fish are continually growing through the year. And so for young fish, they're just growing through your model and it's, it causes a gross, and I think it's one of the reasons we end up with such low effective sample sizes is that the modes aren't lining up correctly. So I've tried to give tools to deal with that through getting the timing right. And I have a number of instances working with folks in the Southeast where they have a lot of young fish data, fish are growing really fast. And by being careful about, oh, this, this survey, it happens in October and their fish are a different size in October than they are in the July survey. And you know, by taking that into account, you can get things lined up better. But I agree that growth is time varying and you end up with a really great morass of process error in order to get all the nuances out of growth. Okay, yes. any other questions? So, Rick, related to that, oh. One? Yeah. Oh, Rick Good. McGovern. In order to run the many phases where there's clearly the population model being called upon repeatedly, is that all built into a separate sub-module? Can that be you give all the parameters and starting values for each year or whatever it is and just run that through? Or how does that work in a software sense? It all happens simul... Well, let's see. As it, it, it runs through a year. Okay? It, at the beginning of a year, it checks to see if any parameters are time varying and it updates the parameters. Then it does all the calculations for that year and, sub and seasons within that year, and any data that exists in that time period, it calculates an expected value for that data, stores those expected values, and then when it gets done processing through the whole time series, and it does this, doesn't, you know, the, it, it does this all as one iteration. 
uh, and then calculates the likelihood for those expected values. We can get back to that. Yeah, that's, that's good stuff. Mark. Okay, um, no other questions. So I, I got a question for you. So when we were trying to implement the growth cessation model, there was some issues with implementing that because of the way the growth was implemented. Was there anything that you learned from that that would help us in programming the next generation? I, I, I continue to learn how complex a growth setup I've created. Um, because of all these nuances of trying to deal with the exact timing stuff, trying to deal with settlement time, that animals start growing when they settle. And the population is composed of some animals that might settle in April, some in May, some in July. So all that complexity, you know, is, I need to deal with it in all aspects of, of the growth estimation. So yeah, I, I think in the creation of the growth cessation model, um, under your, uh, your request, um, you know, we did do some, um, some streamlining, some, some cleanup of the code uh, to try to make it easier to add another. I mean, it's a case statement. And, um, you know, there's, there's several, several different, there's, there's actually four different variants on each specific K just to make it, you know, more straightforward exactly how to do them. So, yeah, we've continued to try to move it. Um, it's not uh, as modular as, uh, you, you know, in, in, as we might eventually want, uh, but it is, you know, essentially a case. And so that it is modularized in that regard. So I, I think we've made progress in making things better along those lines. So basically from that, that specifying how growth is modeled with all these different components would be a fairly major task and an important task before building the next generation model. Yeah, I mean, I think you, uh, there's some design aspects of it. I mean, you know, do we want to deal with this complexity of the details of seasonal growth or, or not? Uh, you know, those are important things that take into account early on in order to, uh, you know, anticipate. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Rick.